reputedly haunted, Sharp and Hope Clappers is a classic chalk escarpment and part of the Chilterns area of outstanding natural beauty. It is crowned with traces of an Iron Age hillfall and an impressive beech wood. Promontory Faults are a type of hillfall in which conspicuous, naturally defended sites are adapted as enclosures by the construction of one or more earth or stone ramparts placed across the neck of a spur in order to divide it from the surrounding land. Coastal situations using headlands defined by steep natural cliffs are common while inland similar topographic settings defined by natural cliffs are also used. The ramparts and accompanying ditches forms the main artificial defence but timber palisades may have been erected along the cliff edges. Access to the interior was generally provided by an entrance through the ramparts. The interior of the fort was used intensively for settlement and related activities and evidence for timber and stone walled roundhouses can be expected together with the remains of buildings used for storage and enclosures for animals. Promontory faults are generally Iron Age in date, most having been constructed and used between the 6th century BC and the mid 1st century AD. They are broadly contemporary with other types of hill fault. They are regarded as settlements of high status, probably occupied on a permanent basis, and recent interpretations suggest that their construction and choice of location had as much to do with display as defence. Promontory faults are rare nationally with less than a hundred recorded examples. Good evening again everyone. Tonight I'm in Bedfordshire and me and Candice, the very lovely Candice, she's just ahead walking in the distance there. We are at Sharp and Ho Clappers, which is another Iron Age hillfall. This one, I believe, is a promontory hillfall. There's different types of hillforts I found out, and we're going to be trying to get away with a little wild camp here tonight. So we've parked the car back at Sharp and Ho Clappers car park. I believe it's National Trust owned, and uh, we've seen a couple of people about, not too many. The views behind us are amazing. The sun is just starting to set because it's coming up to 7 p.m. now. The weather's actually really nice. A little bit of a breeze up here, but nothing, nothing too strong. So this is our views behind us of the valley that Sharp and Ho Clappers overlooks. It's probably not going to be the highest hill fault that we wild camp on, but it's a hill fault nonetheless, and the views are still amazing. Sun's just setting there as you can see, absolutely lovely. There's actually quite a few people out and about I actually spoke to soon. Uh, but it should get quieter later on and I'm sure we'll find somewhere to, to pitch up. So I've got the Wild Country Helm 1 tent again with me tonight. And Candice, here she is. She's got her OEX Fox 1 tent. She's not used that for a while, so she wanted to crack that out. This is a bit of a last minute camp, this one. We plan to go elsewhere and do this one at a later date, but we thought, plans fell through and we thought, why not, let's come here and do this one. So, we're looking forward to this, it should be good fun. So, it's uh, once the sunset's gone, it's going to be getting quite dark, so we'll have to get moving like the clappers. No pun intended. Sharp and ho clappers. Oh, awful. Anyway, yes, yeah, so we believe the hill fault is this way. And once we found a spot and it's quietened down, I'll probably just bring you back then, okay? Chat to you soon. The Iron Age hill fault on the Sharp and Ho clappers forms part of a series of defended sites established along the Chiltern Ridge during the Late Bronze Age and Iron Age. It is however the only regional example of a promontory hill fault, relying for its defence primarily on the strength of its topographical location. 
Its commanding position dominates the local landscape, providing not only defence, but also displaying the status of its former inhabitants. Additional fortifications on the most imposing northern side may also have served this purpose. The trial excavation of a section across the western bank only affected a small part of the monument, but demonstrated that the site retains many well-preserved features, including evidence for timber fortifications crossing the spur, incorporating an entranceway flanked by external ditches. The interior of the fort will retain further buried features relating to the period of use, and evidence of additional timber fortifications may be found on the edges of the promontory. Comparison between the Chiltern Hill Forts, the nearest examples being Ravensburgh Castle some 3 km to the east and Ivinghoe Beacon 15 km to the southwest, will provide important information concerning the nature of their use and their relationship with the surrounding countryside. Sharpenhoe Clappers was bequeathed to the National Trust by W.A. Robertson in memory of his brothers Norman Cairns Robertson, Captain 2nd Battalion Hampshire Regiment who died the 20th of June 1917 at Hanover, Germany and of Lawrence Grant Robertson, 2nd Lieutenant, 2nd Battalion, King's Own Scottish Borders who was killed in action in France during the Battle of the Somme in or near Delville Wood, 30th of June 1916. Warrens have a long history of construction and use dating from the medieval period to the early years of the present century. Documentary sources suggest that the zenith of the Warren construction lay in the late medieval and post medieval periods although the practice is thought to have been established following the introduction of rabbits from Normandy in the 11th century. The warren usually consisted of an enclosure surrounding one or more purpose-built breeding places known as pillow mounds or berries. Existing monuments including burial mounds, motts and boundary banks were sometimes adapted to this use. Warrens provided a consistent supply of meat and skins and formed a significant part of the economy of both ecclesiastical and secular estates. The northern end of the Sharp and Ho Clappers promontory was adapted to serve this purpose during the 15th century when part of the southern bank was constructed as an artificial breeding place. The bank has been shown by limited trial excavation to be well preserved and to retain numerous features of its original design including a solid revetment on the northern side and drainage channels beneath. The bank also seals an earlier ground surface which overlies part of the Iron Age defences. So we've made it up onto the hill fort of Sharp and Hoe Clappers. The sunset is through there of course as you can see. The views are out there as you can see that I've just shown you. Now we would really like to try and wild camp sort of in this area here. It's quite open, but that's not too much of an issue if you're, if you're out early enough. But it's full of tree roots and like very chalky hard ground, so it could be a bit of an issue to peg down onto, even though Candice has got a hammer. So we're thinking of heading into this woodland behind us. It's a lot denser. Hopefully the ground won't be as hard to sort of peg into. We'll see, really. I mean, but... Candice is sort of looking at the ground now, she's sort of brushing the leaves away to see what it's like. So, for views, like in the morning, we'll probably have to quickly pop outside of the woodland, but that's fine. So, for fans of woodland camps there, this could be the video for you then. Right. It's squishier. It's squishier. I think that's just the leaves though, isn't it? Yeah, it's definitely squishy at the bottom. Yeah? Okay yeah. then. Right. Watch this space. Welcome back everyone. So I've set the Wild Country Helm one up and then Candice has got a little OEX Fox one south. Here she is. We've uh, been eating dinner and we've already had a cider. 
and we we found a little like a tiny little clearing in the woodland just off of the footpath and we're fairly well secluded from here and it's a nice flat spot which makes a nice change so Candy show us what cider we've been having the, it's a rhubarb and custard hang on let's get the light off of it might have to angle it a little bit so it's a, a brother's rhubarb and custard English cider four percent this was kindly given to me by my mate Mark, Mark the Posty. Cheers mate. Thanks Mark. It was very nice wasn't it? Yes. We like that. Um, don't know if I've reviewed that before. I'd say it's probably my favourite one out of the Brothers range other than the Toffee Apple one. Candice, what would you give that out of ten? About seven. Seven out of ten, yeah? Yeah. I think I'd give it I'll give it an 8.1 out of 10. I still I'll... prefer the, um, is it the strawberries and cream. Yeah, that's a good one. Strawberries and cream, brother's cider. The one we both disliked was the palm of violets. Yep, that was disgusting. Not a fan, but yeah. And then this is the remains of dinner. So I cooked us some Fray Bentos meatballs in tomato sauce out of a tin and a packet of instant mashed potatoes trying to save a bit of money just because well funds are tight at the moment ration packs I've got some to do they're just ones that I've had before but I had to buy the cheapest ones and yeah to save money I thought I'd get some meatballs and instant mash from Sainsbury's so works out cheaper and we've still got a little bit of leftover mashed potatoes here only problem is it's a lot of washing up to do so the other side we're going to have is one of my mate Hambo's ciders that he got me for Mersey Island, recent wild camp. Cheers mate. So it's a uh, ye old Tom Outdoors Esquire heritage cider. Look at that beard. 7.4%. So it's a, a wear a nappy. This is a a shit yourself in bed <laughs> job I reckon uh, yeah you are falling asleep with your shoes on in your trousers job that one best served outdoors with your favorite ration pack established in 1888 I'll level with you it's actually a bottle of Thatcher's I'm not sure what Thatcher's it is but he's basically uh, put new labels on them if you watch the last video so I'll read it to you again if you've not seen these Ye old Tom Outdoors Esquire Heritage Cider, pick of the year 2019. Tom Outdoors started making cider at his family farm in 1888. Inspired by his passion for the great outdoors, his cider is crafted from the finest natural ingredients selected from the great Essex countryside and matured in oak vats. This is a medium dry, sparkling cider, deep in flavour. Ingredients Lots of apples, loads of outdoor passion, splashes of history, and a little squeeze of candice. <laughs> Bless her. There we go. So I want to say a big, big thank you to Hambo again. Cheers, mate. These were a real surprise, and I think they kind of surprised everyone on the camp. They were amazing. So, yeah, thank you very much. We're going to crack this one open now. This one's for you, old chap. <laughs> Okay, little bit Blair Witch Project. <laughs> look at my glasses. You, you look terrifying. <laughs> Blimey. Don't anyone have nightmares. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> right. Aww. She's got a cold, so I can't kiss her. No. Unfortunately. Right, let's crack this bad boy open. Cheers, Hambo. As Hayes would say, drive by. <laughs> It always cracks not when he does it. I had to just do it the once. Anyway. Hmm. Have a little sniff of that. Mm. Don't know what f smells I'm getting from it anyway. Hmm. Christ, that's strong. Whoa. 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 <laughs> <laughs> strong in it. Yeah. Yeah. 
I don't think, we're not a massive fan of strong ciders, are no. we? I don't know what Thatcher's that is, I'm not sure, but I don't think it's uh it's definitely not a Thatcher's haze. It's not it's definitely not Thatcher's rose. No. I don't know if it's the I don't know if it's a Thatcher's gold. No, it's it can't be Thatcher's gold. It could be the rascal one, the old rascal, I'm not sure. Mm. <laughs> the old rascal. Yeah. I had that before. Hmm. It's a faint taste of apple coming through, but it's very, very smoky. Strong. And strong, yeah. It's very a, strong. It's definitely medium dry. It's on the right. It's on the cusp of being a dry cider. Yeah. Really, if it was any drier, I wouldn't drink it. But that just about saves it. I mean, what would you give it out of ten? Be honest. Five. A five out of yeah. ten, yeah. I'm gonna give it I'm gonna give it a five point eight and I'm only I'm giving it more just because it's mainly the labels. The labels are amazing. Labels are ten, but you know the drink. The la yeah, if we was if it was basing it on the design of the bottle yeah. we'd give it definitely a nine out of ten. Yeah. A high nine out of ten, but as it's about the cider as well, the cider does let it down, but that's fine, that's not yeah. a problem. We still appreciate it, Hambo, cheers. Yeah, yeah. We are grateful, honestly. No, just cheers. We're just gonna be, gonna be peace. Yeah, fucked, yeah. I just wanted to say that. Yeah, well, enough. you'd say it's all right, you know. Grown ups on here, just don't let your kids watch, you know. There is a thing called YouTube Kids. You should look into it. Anyway, <laughs> right, ran over. Anyway, I don't mind it, it's, it's not too bad. Mm. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, cheers Hambo, and cheers everyone. Bye. It's about half past ten now. We've finished both ciders, and we've eaten our, our food for the night. So it's time for a galaxy hot chocolate. The OEX Takana stove is still working wonders. Gas is running a bit low on it, but it's still working fine. Very efficient, these stoves, because they don't use a lot of gas, of course, to, to boil water with, because of the built-in windshield and stuff. But they get the last drop of gas out of a cartridge, so you won't be left with like a little bit at the bottom. It will literally run the whole thing down, which is really good. All of our rubbish is in that black bag there. And yeah, I'll try and show you inside the tent in a little bit. Well, actually, I'll do it now while I'm waiting for the water to boil up. It's the uh, same shit, different day, really. Same sort of setup as normal. And uh, got me go light down sleeping bag. Great sleeping bag, it's about 800 grams. I think it's two or three season. I've got the OEX Traverse mat, full length inflatable, and then my silver decathlon pad, £4.50. The rucksack and everything else is in the little back vestibule. I forgot to bring a pillow tonight, but that's fine. I'll just use spare clothes rolled up. Uh, to be fair, it is really warm tonight. I've put my down jacket but I don't really need it as such. A little cheap lantern from Decathlon as well. Not Decathlon, uh, Audi, sorry. It's under a tenner, I know that. No bugs or anything. Lots of little spiders. So the devil, there's one. But that's it really. We've not really seen any gnats or midges, mosquitoes or any flies or anything it's been pretty good oh we've got boil on Candice's little setup in there as well she's got a, a Black's Apex uh, down sleeping bag bright pink I think that's that's under a kilo as well because it was originally mine I gave it to her and uh, I think she's got have you got your OEX half pad? Oh no, um, I've got a full pad. Oh, your full length yeah. firmer rest. Yeah. And your silver decathlon one as yeah. well. 
She's got a little porch here as well, of course, yeah. to store everything. Yeah. Right, let's get that hot chocolate made. Well, it's gone 11 p.m. now, I think. I haven't really checked the time. We're both in our respective tents. It's actually really warm. I'm in like a t-shirt and my thermal long johns, and I'm I'm actually really warm. I've, I'm not even in the sleeping bag. I, I could sleep like this to be honest. Candice has has gone all out, and she's got a softy trousers on. I was like, you're gonna be sweating, love. <laughs> um, what else? What else she got on? Leggings on. She's got her Aztec leggings on, right? Because she couldn't find you couldn't find your thermal leggings, oh. could you? And her, her Aztec leggings make her bum look rather big. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've got my thermal t-shirt. I've just got t-shirt on. Thermal t-shirt and a t-shirt and your softies. Yeah. Oh, you took the softies off now then. You still got your softies on, and you got your Arctic socks on, yeah. and a normal pair of socks. I honestly, I mean, I've got all my other stuff over the back here. I've got Arctic socks. I've got the softies as well. I mean, I think we've gone a bit overkill with the stuff. This is more like winter setups we've got uh, for this camp, and it's actually turned out to be really warm and quite mild and nice. I mean, we're, you know, because we're in the woods here, it's sheltered from the wind and everything. I haven't had to peg out the guy lines, A to save space and B because we just didn't really need them. Yeah so all my spare clothes I'm just going to use as a, as a pillow really because I forgot to bring my pillow as I mentioned. Yeah. So we're both, we're both comfortable in our tents anyways, it's, it's, it's a summarise sorry. We sat outside earlier on. We sort of walked over the other side of the hill fault to like kind of the side where the sun had set. And it was a really nice view actually. It was dark, but you could see all the lights on in the distance, trains in the distance, like the main roads and stuff and houses and that. Sort of the larger towns over in the distance on the horizon, all lit up and stuff. Kind of like a circuit ball, it looked really nice. We sort of sat there, finished off the last of Hambo cider, cheers mate, and then made our way back to the tents, made a hot chocolate of course, going to have that and then get some sleep. We'll see you in the morning. Good night everyone. Morning. The Sharp and Ho Clappers is an imposing promontory on the northern edge of the Chiltern Hills 
approximately one and a half kilometres to the southwest of Barton Le Clay. The Iron Age Fort is situated in a commanding position on the northern end of the spur, some 90 metres above the surrounding countryside to the north, east and west. The promontory fort is roughly rectangular in plan, measuring 250 metres north to south and 150 metres from east to west, defined by steep slopes on all but the southern side. The area contained by the abrupt edges of the natural scarps rises gently towards the central spine of the promontory, forming a relatively level plateau. A mature beechwood now covers this plateau, which forms the interior of the fall. There is no evidence for ramparts on the eastern or western rim, although a timber palisade would have provided sufficient defence in addition to the natural gradients. Two shallow terraces cut into the northern slope are thought to indicate more elaborate fortifications added to the most imposing side of the site, perhaps for the purpose of displaying status as well as defence. Two banks aligned across the neck of the spur separate the fort from the high ground to the south. The banks have long been considered to represent the southern defences of the fort. However, although partial excavation of the western bank in 1979 demonstrated they overlay a palisade trench containing Iron Age pottery, the bank itself was constructed in the medieval period. The western bank is thought to have been constructed as a breeding place or pillow mound for rabbits. The section cut through the bank in 1979 revealed sequential layers of soil and chalk distributed by numerous burrows and containing fragments of 14th and 15th century pottery. How did you sleep? I slept very well, seriously. Except for the owls that were having a conversation with each other. It was, was really nice to hear them. I completely missed this. I didn't even hear the owls last night. I was dead to the world. Yeah. It's just gone. But you was warm and cosy and comfy. Excellent. It's half nine. We're all packed away. And we are leaving absolutely no trees, I mean trace. We've got all of our rubbish in the black bag there. We'll leave that here for the National Trust to do. After all, that's what our membership covers. I'm joking, we're taking it with us, don't worry. <laughs> and there we go, leaves kicked back. You'd hardly know we were here. Candice has got the rubbish. Right. It's back to the car, so enough talking and let's get walking. We've walked along the perimeter track on the east side of the hill fault, clearly marked track, seen a few more potential spots for camping, but the central woodland was probably the best bit for us really, so we, we got lucky with that. And then we're leaving the hill fault now, down this steep bank, like rampart. Now this, this I believe is man-made, this bit, so the rest of that slope back there on like the north side of the hill fault is of course a natural promontory a natural cliff edge whereas this bit as i say is all man-made because this is the only entrance into the hill fault or well this side the south side is is the only entrance into the hill fault so 
yeah, I just thought I'd let you know anyway. So Candice is struggling, bless her, to get down this. It is quite steep. Yeah, there we go. How cool is that? You can actually see almost the design of it. Of course, if I had a drone, it'd be even easier for you to see, but they cost money. Right, I think we're heading back that way to the car. The bank overlies a buried surface containing fragments of Iron Age and Roman pottery and was originally constructed against a series of posts set into holes beneath the northern edge. These posts were later removed and replaced by a solid revetment of chalk rubble which would have enabled more effective culling of the stock by restricting the number of entrances. Two parallel channels had been dug across the slope beneath this section of the bank prior to its construction. These channels would have provided drainage for the interior of the bank and are a characteristic feature of medieval warren mounds. The interior of the Iron Age Fault remained as pasture until the establishment of the beech plantation in the 1840s and is thought to have formed a warren associated with the bank. The warren may have been enclosed by a fence separating the rabbits from surrounding areas of cultivation. Two medieval cultivation terraces, lynchets, lie to the south of the western bank. The monument was first identified as a British camp in 1874 based on its commanding location and apparent southern defences. The name Clappers is thought to derive from the medieval Latin term Clapirius, or the French clapier, meaning a heap of stones or rabbit hole. The name was first documented in 1575, at which time it may have referred specifically to the Warren. Since the 19th century, the name has applied to the entire spur. We're back at the car park here at Sharpen Clappers Hill Fault. That's the end of this video. It's been a good little camp that and I should point out that I wouldn't have heard of Sharp No Clappers if it were not for a subscriber or someone that commented on one of my recent Hillfall videos. So apologies for forgetting your name but you know who you are. Thank you very much for recommending this place to me. It has been absolutely brilliant. We've enjoyed it haven't yeah, we? It's been really fun. good. So big thank you to Candice joining me on this one. Can't kiss her, she's got a cold sore. Okay. Yeah, it's been good. Yeah. She loves a hill fall. I do. So do I, yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's the end of this video. I hope you've enjoyed it and the history and stuff and the camp. It's been nice. So until next time, take care of yourselves and look after each other. Stay safe, everyone. We'll see you on the next one. Cheers, goodbye. Bye. Come on then, you're coming down. Use the bum. Yeah. I'm surprised that I've got a hole in my arse. So like in the hole in your arse? Don't no, say that. <laughs> no, like in the trail. You should have. No, well, I've like gone down the side, like it's proper rubbed away. What's the matter, Jean? I can't poo. I'm all bonged up. <laughs> Would be if you didn't have a hole in your ass. Anyway, oh. let me get this on Tom outdoors. So on PC. You right? Yeah, I did. Oh, dang, great for You did. You're all right. <laughs>